let me go back just a minute because I I sat in Max Chamberlain's office in 1962 when Chamberlain, Buck Sampson, and Ralph Alley were talking about the STS, and I was a uh, an intern or just finished an internship, and so I mean I was thrilled at the nod of uh, becoming part of an organization that these guys were talking about forming. Chamberlain at that time was just talking about having a society to represent thoracic surgeons who had no society because only 300 people could be in the AATS. So, I mean, I was an STS guy before it ever got started because these guys were my heroes. And uh, they started this, uh, this group, Max did. It was his idea. The reason that STS did so well is that it was it was a a uh, event that was born in a vacuum, and it just grew like topsy because of that. You know, I mean, if you look back on it, you can't and read all this stuff. You you can't help but feel that that uh, Buck Sampson was right from day one. You know, because he had the opinion that uh, we. We didn't have an organization for all these people, et cetera, et cetera. Shortly after I passed my boards in thoracic surgery, uh, Dr. Glover and Dr. Dabbert took me to a meeting that I think was the initial meeting of this society to talk about getting it started. And Max Chamberlain, of course, was there. And I remember Glover and Chamberlain as being the two main uh, proponents of this society. Cardiothoracic surgery had progressed to the point of needing a society of its own to develop research, much like the plastic surgeons and the neurological surgeons and so forth. The idea was that every qualified uh, practicing cardiothoracic surgeon uh, with good standing in the community should have access to the STS and that was important and that's why I was pleased to be part of it. We are a service profession and the people we serve are our patients. And uh, we strive for excellence. We'd like to give them the best that is available. And crucial for maintaining high standards is uh, research, education, and continuing education. Surgery has changed a lot. We still use scalpels, that's true, but where we use them and what we do with them is very, very different. I mean, a lot of operations being do done every day were mountains to surmount, you know, 50 years ago. And uh, a lot of our understanding of what the heart can do and what can't, it can't do uh, and how it heals, we didn't know in the beginning. And the, uh, the heart-lung machine still isn't fully tamed, although it is much more corralled than it was. Uh, and so there's a lot to learn, but that's what makes medicine so interesting. Well, I became a member in the early 1970s, which have reflected many times since then about this being the golden era, at least of cardiac surgery. Many things were going on. We had extraordinary pathology, more work than we could handle, and it was a marvelous time. And of course, things have changed since, but uh, at that time, it was a terrific time to be a cardiac surgeon. Practice in the early 80s was quite different than it is today. At that time, everything was pretty much standard sternotomy type of incision or a large thoracic incision uh, for a lung resection. Uh, coronary surgery was king. We hadn't evolved to the point we have we are today with thoracic surgery. Uh, mitral valve repair was just beginning to evolve. Uh, and uh, financial reimbursement was terrific for these procedures. So. All of the, uh, in a university setting, had money in their coffers they could disperse for research and education. It was quite dif uh, different, and we thought it was going to go on forever the same way. But it changed, and it had to change. And it cha the changes that you're seeing today start to evolve. 
I think uh, for the specialty, one of the concerns was a, a period of maybe relative stagnation in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and during that time, the reimbursement for us in coronary bypass was very robust. Uh, and I think that we became a little intoxicated with that uh, part of our activity. And uh, we, we gave up some things at that time. We gave up pacemakers, which we used to own. Uh, we gave up uh, some uh, endoscopy work. Uh, and uh, we uh, cut back on some of the scope of our activity because the reimbursement was so good in coronary bypass, there were not too many of us, and uh, it was a, it was a you know, very positive time as far as financial benefit. And I think that that hurt us a little bit uh, in, that, in that we needed to uh, readdress our participation in innovation and in new techniques. And I think that we've done that successfully, but it took us about five to 10 years to get ramped back up again. There is a different spirit here right now. We had the time uh, in the early 2005 to 2010 that there was a kind of depression that people uh, not really believed in this in the future of cardiac surgery and I think this has completely changed um, th through the leadership of uh, the STS presidents uh, in the past years it, who demonstrated by, that by in introducing innovation and being o open for uh, new things that there is a future uh, uh, for young cardiac surgeons both uh, in America and in the world and I think this has dramatically impacted on the spirit and uh, has changed um, the people's mind, the members minds. The field of cardiothoracic surgery has changed tremendously in the last 10 years in many ways. Um, it's a constantly evolving specialty. Uh, minimally invasive surgery is now much more popular. Um, and we've also seen the face of the cardiothoracic surgeon change in that we have many more women now applying to medical school and hopefully we'll have many more women in our specialty. Right about the mid 80s, uh, where I'd only been in the STS about uh, 10 years, there was a, uh, the issue of public reporting without having risk adjustment and adjusted outcomes became a real issue and uh, we in the cardiothoracic surgery area had had that happen to us and decided to develop our own database in the STS. And uh, that's been, uh, it's really been fun to watch that uh, develop. It's gone from, from starting in uh, 1989 under the leadership of Richard Clark and then it was Fred Edwards, myself and, and a number of others, Dave Sheehan now, and just dozens of uh, people that have put in a lot of hard work. Uh, great staff, uh, we now have uh, around 5 million patients in that database and, and I think close to 95% voluntary participation of adult cardiac surgeons, 105 out of 125 congenital programs belong to the congenital heart data, pediatric heart database, and a large uh, percentage of our members belong to the general thoracic uh, database. Second uh, issue was the healthcare uh, reform issue. Uh, in 1999, approximately, there was a uh, proposed 40% reduction in payments for cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, Robert Repogel led the charge. Jack Matloff was in our Washington office. Uh, we developed the STS PAC, uh, and we uh, mobilized, turned that 40% uh, reduction into a 20% reduction uh, rolled in over, over four years. So it was a huge uh, boost for the society. Beyond that, uh, Peter Smith and, and uh, Sid Levitsky were working on the RUC at the same time, uh, and the database allowed us to prove that we were operating on sicker and more high-risk patients, and that the increases that we asked for in reimbursement were justified and data-driven. That was uh, major. With the idea of more nimbleness in mind, uh, we began to look at the structure of the STS organization. It was not efficient. And we set about with Gordon Murray, who was Secretary Treasurer at that time, to rewrite our Constitution. Out of that came the, the workforce structure, 
that the society now has. The second initiative that, that came from that was taking a hard look at how the STS was being run administratively. Were we doing the best job we could with, with the organizational structure that we had? So we had the initiative of rewriting the bylaws to make us more nimble, of assessing how our long-standing external management company was, was handling the STS business, recruiting a new executive director, and then the next initiative became, where's our new house gonna be? We looked at four or five different buildings, presenting these initiatives to the, at the business meeting, um, I don't know that anyone will, will recall, uh, as I did, the, um, the um, passion with which some of the old guard um, felt we had absolutely, we as a group and me particularly, that we had just bitten off far too much and that the society was doomed. You can't change. You can't change the constitution. You can't blow up your existing administrative uh, management structure. You can't move to a new to a new building and a new home for the organization. Uh, in one swoop, the society won't sustain it. And the same strength that's always existed in this organization of volunteers uh, who made it happen uh, prevailed, and and it did happen and uh, it's been an ongoing source of, of uh, pride to me. Well, to me, the single most important thing that uh, this is when I came back as the treasurer uh, of the society, that's when the decision was made uh, to become a self-managed organization. And to me, that's really the most important thing that happened to the organization, to the society, that decision, which was not intuitively obvious that it was the right thing to do. But to me, it's the thing that led, it was the springboard to everything that the Society of Thoracic Surgeons has become. In looking at other organizations, I realized that most of them had a special history to the gavels they used for their annual meetings. The American Surgeon had a, a gavel made from the wood from the founder of Sam, Sam Adams disc. The American Society of OBGYN took wood from the, the uh, house of Ephraim McDowell, who did the first abdominal surgical operation. So it was my ch choice to look to make a gavel for the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. And I pestered Mark Oranger and his wife to go to John Alexander's old home and get me a piece of cherry wood from his trees. They finally went over, asked Mrs. Oranger, went over, asked the lady, said, well, sure, no problem. So I got some wood. We made three gavels, one for the society. What is a gift to the European Association of Thoracic Surgery? And the other, the European Society of Thoracic Surgery. So now that's one of my legacies that leaves those gavels in the hands of those leaders. What I really enjoyed about my first meetings was being around some of the giants, uh, the historical giants in uh, cardiothoracic surgery over the years, the real pioneers, because back at that time they were still uh, very, very uh, active and it was an exciting uh, intellectual environment and, and a, an exciting group to be around. The field is moving so rapidly and adopting new technology and changing technologies. And the journals many times are a year or two behind. The best way for a active clinical surgeon uh, to acquire this information is to go 
to the SDS meetings, whether it be TechCon or the regular meetings, uh, and to begin to acquire this information. The other important issue is the networking. Uh, sometimes in practice one could feel isolated, even within a, a big academic institution, but you see some of the problems that you're having are uh, the same problems that other institutions are having, and by working together and collaborating and talking and networking, you come to rational solutions rather than going off on the wrong track. So I think it's very helpful in that way. I would definitely describe it as that feeling of a kid in a candy store. It was rare prior to that time to be surrounded by so many people interested in the same thing. I found it very inspiring and it made me want to get involved with more research projects and uh, contribute, sort of give back to the society as well. I began doing things in Washington, D.C. and in the state, and I wasn't on an appointed workforce or task force, but people perceived me as being a leader. And it's that kind of, those kind of activities, you know, creating something at your local level, creating a new healthcare delivery model, creating something that's innovative that's going to bring something to the STS. That's leadership. Having a name uh, in a workforce is not necessarily leadership. I, I just want everybody to, to be a leader and, and to understand that they're, everyone is important and can get do something very significant for the society. I volunteered uh, to be an STS leader because I thought it was an opportunity to make a contribution, uh, both to the specialty and ideally, if possible, to make a contribution to medicine in general. Um, and that extends from all levels, both at the level of helping to others to learn from what our experience or scientific uh, knowledge advancements uh, were being made, uh, as well as potentially to influence the practice of uh, cardiothoracic surgery and uh, ideally even potentially the practice of medicine. Uh, by focusing on you know, some issues that weren't just uh, confined to what happens in the operating room, how we can do an operation better, but also I think some larger issues that affect how we all practice and ultimately how we can take better care of our patients. You know, uh, the things that occur when you're present never occur in a vacuum. They're built upon uh, initiatives that preceded you. Uh, it's kind of like building a, uh, a house. There's a foundation and each president adds to it. Uh, and so it's never in a vacuum. Uh, and it's never done by a single person. It's done by the organization and all those who've preceded you. No, I think it's, it's good that um, there are still some of us alive who, who are able to share this. Um, I'm saddened by the loss of some recent members. The uh, person who I think about is uh, Carolyn Reed. Uh, Carolyn, uh, who unfortunately passed away in late uh, 2012, she kept a shoebox. And in the shoebox, she put every single note, every letter that came from her patients. I actually do the same thing. I keep them all, but I don't have them in a single spot. I have them scattered in bags that memorabilia. She kept them all in a box. So every time she would have some issue, something didn't go right, you know, some problem, she'd go in her shoebox and pull out. I know. And it was a way to bring you back to why you went into this profession to begin with. And uh, so uh, for young people, uh, I really tell them, if you love to work with your hands, you want to benefit patients, you want to feel good about uh, what you do every day, and still have areas that definitely can be improved on, uh, it's a terrific field. It's intensive, there's no question. It's not meant for everybody, uh, 
but it's uh, a really, I think, uh, a tremendous uh, profession. Uh, it's as exciting today, I think, as was 30 years ago when I first started. My presidential address was, if this was my last speech, what would I say? Uh, and it was at a time where um, surgeons were not feeling good about what we're doing and about our specialty. And my message was, are you kidding me? We've got the greatest job in the world. What don't you understand about that? So it was an, an attempt to say, you know, you know what? We've got the greatest job in the world. Uh, we have a privilege from society that nobody else has. Uh, the issues, the decisions that we make every day, nobody else has that opportunity. And um, boy, let's embrace it. Be involved. Uh, don't just uh, accept a passive role of the specialty and do more than just going to work at the hospital every day and taking care of patients. That's a great thing to do. That's the core of what we do. But there's more that one can do. And it's by being involved with colleagues in the specialty, by being involved in your specialty society, it's how we impact education, it's how we impact policy, and it's how we can make things better for our patients every day. What excites me the most about the future of cardiothoracic surgery is that we're innovators. We're innovating patient care, whether it's transcatheter valves, minimally invasive oncologic surgery. We're coming up with decision tools that incorporate molecular and clinical data to deliver uh, personalized care to patients. We're innovators in terms of surgical education. We're revamping our curriculum so we can better train the future uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, we are innovators in terms of research. We're bringing together basic scientists as well as health services researchers and using cutting edge methods to conduct the best translational research, moving findings from the bench to the bedside. CSS is, is, um, is a great society that has shown to people that you should collaborate with cardiologists, um, especially now in the field with transcatheter heart valves. They have shown that collaboration with cardiology um, also specialties and societies is beneficial for both specialties and for the patients. Uh, the TFT registry is a great example where surgeons collaborated, societies collaborated with other societies and uh, that really can provide data and can show us you know what patient would benefit from which kind of treatment. I think that it will continue to be uh, a organization that provides uh, leadership uh, for the profession that it will uh, continue to provide the opportunity for mentorship and scholarship across all levels of training from candidate member to active member. I think that it will continue to play a role uh, in shaping uh, healthcare policy uh, through the use of its database uh, as things will likely continue to change across the healthcare landscape. In the past, we've concentrated on our area of expertise, and the future will work as teams with all uh, other types of providers that are involved in the particular disease at hand, whether it's heart disease or lung cancer or congenital problems, and we will work as a team to deliver the best care and, and, and provide the best outcomes to our patients. So in order to make this major transformation in how healthcare is delivered, we need leadership. And I think the STS will provide that leadership. It's just a great time to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. And I think that the, the future is, is wide open for our young and emerging surgeons. Uh, thought I came into the specialty at a great time, uh, and I did. But I think it's equally great right now, and I think the next 50 years are going to be fantastic. Fantastic.